our great God and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we could have this time, indeed an extra day for us to study your word, but may we count it indeed a great privilege that we should be able to do so and apply our minds diligently to the word we will study today, and may it indeed enable us to be better ministers of the word and profitable counselors as well to those who are seeking our guidance. So be with us today, and may your name be glorified. Let the prophet be ours. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Uh, let me say that I am a believer in the death penalty, uh, as long as the, there is a certainty both of guilt and the enormity of crime. But most countries today have already renounced the death penalty, including the Philippines. Uh, next to the death penalty, Perhaps the worst that still is imposed in most countries is the sentence of life without the possibility of parole. You see, simple life sentence really means about 20-25 years. But life sentence without parole means that you will spend all your life until you die in jail. You are alive, but uh, the thought that there will be no parole means that you will have to accept the reality of paying for your crime throughout all your life. Now there is something of an equivalent of that which is even worse to imagine and that is the so-called unpardonable sin and that is what we will address this morning in our class. Now the idea of the unpardonable sin when you look at the references we have they are only a small part of the biblical teaching on sin. There is so much that the Bible teaches us concerning sin. There is so much more when we talk of imputed sin or original sin that we have been doing. We talk of total depravity and total inability. There is so much that the Bible teaches us concerning these things. But an explicit reference to what is considered as unpardonable really only have three references and they are even parallels in the synoptic gospels so you really have only one reference in combination of these three texts from the synoptic gospels and yet despite the smallness in proportion to other teachings concerning sin this issue has become a complex pastoral problem because I am sure you have had people approach you. I have had people approaching me over so many years asking that they may have committed the unpardonable sin. And you try to deal with them. The very fact that I shall show that one has anxiety over the possibility that he has committed the unpardonable sin is a sure sign that he has not. But that has become a complex pastoral problem and dealing with attitude to sin requires of us the balance of sensitive watchfulness without crippling guilt. It is possible that you may dismiss the issue and say, no, you're not guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit as we will see it is called in the references or we uh, give them some advice that leads to a crippling, paralyzing guilt. So in on two counts, we need to be very careful. Our counsel when it comes to sin, so counsel, you're a counselor, whether you like it or not, as a pastor, you will have to counsel uh, on issues of sin. Uh, I remember Jay Adams saying that in counseling, you deal with three kinds of people, uh, the mad, the sad, and the bad, uh, which means the person who is dealing with some issue of anger, another dealing with issue of depression, and then those who are dealing with issues of sin. So the mad, the sad, and the bad, well, we are dealing with the bad in this sense that when we counsel people we have to deal with their sin and we always have to watch not to go to one extreme and that is dismissive you try to make the person feel good and we become dismissive of his real problem with sin on the other hand is the sense of paralysis 
paralyzing or let's just call this guilt, crippling guilt. Crippling guilt means the person is feeling guilty more than he should. Uh, and there is that kind of problem that Apostle Paul warns the Corinthians. Remember in 2 Corinthians 2, why a person who has been censured by the church needs to be confirmed with love by the brethren so that the devil may not be able to uh, wield his schemes against the person who is made to feel more guilty than he should. So these are the two things we should avoid and this happens very often in the matter of dealing with the so-called unpardonable sin. So we begin with the right beginning and that is to look at the references. And as I have said, there are only three of them and they are in fact parallels in the synoptic gospels. Although as we shall see, there are nuances of differences. Uh, one is in Mark 3, 28 to 30 where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but, uh, but whatever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, He has an unclean spirit. Then Luke 12 and verse 10, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven and then matthew 12 31 and 32 therefore i tell you every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven and whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven but whoever speaks against the holy spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come so you have the fullest version in Matthew, but uh, some versions of it, both in Mark and Luke. And if we try to compare uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see in the Gospel of Mark, it is any sins against the sons of men, or translated in the other versions as children of men. So it's referring to mankind in general, whereas both Matthew and Luke has the Son of Man, which of course is one of the titles of Jesus. But there really is no contradiction here because Jesus as Son of Man is the ultimate man. And uh, the sons of ma men, the, the mankind, is what they are at creation as well as in their fall. Now Jesus came to restore what humanity should have been, which Adam failed to do. Now Jesus, a second Adam, is in that sense son of man as well as the Danielic son of man in Daniel 7 as the one who will rule over kingdoms and nations. So uh, uh, there is no real contradiction. Mark is in his version referring more to our sins against our fellow men and Matthew and Luke in their versions refer to a sin that is committed against Jesus as son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, it's not a contradiction, but we note that difference. Another is that the context of Matthew and Mark is the so-called Beelzebub controversy. After Jesus exorcised a demon-possessed man, the Pharisees accused him of being able to do so because of the power of Beelzebub, one of the titles attributed to the devil. So in other words, they saw the miracle, they saw something that needed explanation, and as we shall see, they have the explanation understood, but they preferred to blaspheme against the Lord Jesus Christ by attributing it to the devil when in fact they know it is of the Holy Spirit. So you have this uh, in the case of, of Mark and Matthew, it's the Beelzebub issue. But in Luke, it is about confessing Christ before men. So confession is the context of Luke as Christ is sending his disciples to confess him before men. And in that uh, confession, 
uh, one can be guilty as they listen to the confession of the disciples. They may see as the disciples of Jesus' time were given the same power of exorcism of demonic spirits. They may, uh, as they treated Jesus, they will treat His disciples in the same way in that they resist the confession of the word even if it is clear that the Holy Spirit is at work uh, before them. So these are the references we have and the only references that are explicit as to the sin that will not be forgiven. So with that in mind, uh, the question of course is, what is this? What is this sin? And if it is a sin that is still active and we are able to fall into it, then we need to be mindful. Uh, have we fallen into it? And as I have said, as a pastor, you will get people inquiring of you and you need to give them advice. But advice that is biblical. So we need to first dismiss what are wrong interpretations of the so-called sin that is unpardonable. Uh, there is this interpretation that says it is a sin that can be committed only during Christ's incarnate state. In other words, during the earthly ministry of Jesus, as Jesus was challenging the people, the Jews in particular, to accept His kingdom, and they would not accept, now Christ has been has died and rose, has risen again from the dead that is over uh, the trial of accepting Jesus as he confronts them personally has now happened and it is only then it, they, it is argued that the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can be committed in the presence of Jesus personally or physically and therefore, it is no longer a sin that is possible to be committed. The main argument here is, of course, the fact that the most direct references to the unpardonable sin are only in these three Gospels, in the Synoptics. And therefore, they conclude from that that it is therefore not a sin that is possible after Christ is no longer physically present. It is a sin that is only active, so to speak, during the earthly ministry of Jesus. Uh, but there are some critiques or problems to that position. And the first of these is that uh, this particular unpardonable blasphemy, as it is called, is directed against the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus makes it explicit that the blasphemy against the Son of Man will be forgiven. So it's a pardonable sin. What is unpardonable is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So if it is something that necessitates the presence of Jesus Christ physically, it would be surprising that he should consider that sin which is against the Holy Spirit in the light of the fact that the Holy Spirit in fact replaces the personal presence of Jesus Christ as he tells the disciples in what is called the Upper Room Discourse. In John 13 and following chapters, he kept speaking of the Paracletos, often translated as Comforter or Helper, referring to the Holy Spirit. He will be gone, Jesus would be gone, but then the Holy Spirit will come. In fact, he makes it emphatic that if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, cannot come. And there is therefore, in that sense, a replacement. Not replacement that Jesus is gone from us personally, but in the sense of the more direct uh, dealing of God with us is now through the person of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if this unpardonable sin is against the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not gone. In fact, His presence has become all the more emphatic after Jesus Christ died and rose again. It is then that the Holy Spirit has been able to minister, to operate as He should, which is according to Jesus, He will glorify me, He will not speak of Himself. And in fact, in John 7, 39, John makes the comment that uh, 
The Holy Spirit is not yet given because Jesus is not yet glorified. So the very presence of the Holy Spirit is premised upon Jesus going away or ascending to His Father in heaven. And that makes it now the uh, glorious presence of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. So if this is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it cannot be argued that now Jesus is gone. Yes, Jesus is gone physically, but the uh, the replacement for that physical presence is the more permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So that is a problem to this interpretation that this is a sin that can only be committed during Jesus' incarnate state. Another problem to that is again, the, this is the reason why we looked at the nuances of difference among the synoptics. Yes, during uh, in Matthew and Mark versions, you have the Beelzebub issue, Jesus exorcised. But as I have said, we look at another parallel of this in the Gospel of Luke and it is about confessing Christ. Now, confessing Christ has not ended. In fact, it has become even more global, more widespread because Jesus has gone up to heaven because He has completed His mission. Remember what Jesus told His disciples, greater work than this you will do. It's not that greater are the disciples than Jesus. It means the scope of the confession of Christ will be all the greater as a result of Jesus completing His work. And therefore, the completion of His work makes the confession even more widespread, even more fruitful, more powerful. And in Lucan version of this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it happens in the context of the confession of Christ. So even if Christ is gone to heaven, he, the confession of Christ, rather than uh, being done, is all the more activated. And that's another problem of this interpretation. And another problem is Jesus says in the Matthew version, there is the reference to the age to come. Now, the age to come is not just referring to heaven as a realm. Uh, he is not simply saying no forgiveness on earth, no forgiveness in heaven. That is how many interpret this. When Jesus uses this age and age to come, he is speaking a familiar expression used by the Jews, especially in the intertestamental period where the distinction is between this age of sin and then when the Messiah comes, he will bring about and usher in the age to come. Now what happens was, instead of a neat division uh, where you have this age, and age to come divided by the coming of the Messiah that's the expectation in the intertestamental period now that has been changed because when the Messiah came this age still continues so the modification now is that this age of sin suffering etc this has now been invaded by the age to come. So there is the inauguration of the age to come. But it is not yet consummated. The consummation is at the second coming. So we are in this interim when the age to come has already begun but not yet completed, yet to be completed at the coming of Jesus Christ. 
So we can say that this age still continues, but it will terminate at the second coming of Christ. Now, Jesus is saying that the unpardonable sin is such, that it is unpardonable both in this age, the age of sin and suffering before the Messiah uh, has, in, has come to His kingdom or come in His kingdom, uh, but also in the age to come, even when the kingdom has come, and then even when it has been consumed, it will be consummated at the second coming, that, that sin will not be pardoned. So again, that is a serious problem to the interpretation that the unpardonable sin is only uh, something that can be committed during the earthly state or earthly incarnate ministry of Jesus Christ. So we dismiss that interpretation. And then there is another wrong interpretation we need to dismiss, and that is the view that it is any sin directed against the Holy Spirit. And I think this is the most irresponsible interpretation uh, because they only see as way of an argument that it is a contrast between the Son of Man, Christ, and then the Holy Spirit. And they think by their interpretation that all sins against other persons of the Triune God are pardonable, but the sin against the Holy Spirit is unpardonable. Now, how that is so is not explained. But the problem here is that the texts, meaning the synoptic gospels, identify only one particular sin. It's not any sin, but one particular sin against the Holy Spirit, which is here called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, the New Testament speaks of other sins we can commit. Even Christians can commit against the Holy Spirit, such as what? Well, Ephesians 4.30, grieving the Holy Spirit. In what context? In a wrong attitude and behavior with the brethren. Now, do not also, there are uh, wrong concepts of grieving the Holy Spirit as understood as any sin. Every time you sin, the Holy Spirit is grieved. Now, in a sense, of course, the Holy Spirit is grieved by every sin. But in the context of Ephesians 4, the grieving of the Holy Spirit especially occurs in the context of a wrong and faulty, sinful relationship with brethren. And that's where Paul says, do not have any malice or wrath against your brethren but forgive one another so it's in the context of relationship of brethren the fellowship in the church where we can grieve the holy spirit and definitely christians can be guilty of that but no one will say that that is unpardonable you and i are often perhaps regularly guilty of a wrong attitude to a brother or sister and yet we confess those sins and we do not think that we have sinned to a point that we become unpardonable. Or there is also the sin of quenching the Holy Spirit as Paul warns in 1 Thessalonians 5. In the context, it is about prophetic gifts. But we can extend that to other gifts as well. But more likely it happens when one has a prophetic gift, which was a revelatory gift, therefore confined to the age of active revelation, and that is until the completion of the written revelation. Uh, but the idea of quenching the Holy Spirit, we can extend to other gifts that the Holy Spirit has given. We can be, sin we can be sinning against the Holy Spirit when we do not actively use the gifts He has given to us in service for the kingdom of Christ. That is sin, but no one will say that when we fail to use our gifts, we have committed the unpardonable sin. So I said this is the most irresponsible interpretation because it simply makes any sin against the Holy Spirit unpardonable without due regard to many sins we can commit against the Holy Spirit, but the texts. All texts, uh, parallel as they are, they use that same word blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Then there is the view that this sin is the falling away of the saved. Now this is held by those who believe that salvation can be lost. 
and that means the person is initially saved and he may continue for a while but he can live a lifestyle of retreating from his commitment to God, becoming cold, and then declining, backsliding until totally he falls away. So this is a view that is held by those who believe that salvation can be lost and there are evangelicals who take that position and we just have to reject this. This is against and inconsistent with the doctrine of what we call the preservation and perseverance of the saints. And this is not the time to explain this, but the Bible does teach that our security of salvation is based on the work of the triune God, uh, based on the Father's work. Uh, the Father is greater than all, Jesus said in Math, uh, John chapter 10, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So what is at stake in the secure salvation of the saints is the greatness of God. It is also grounded upon the death of Jesus Christ, upon the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Hebrews 7.25 says that uh, He is able to save to the uttermost because He ever intercedes on our behalf. So that's preservation, and preservation is evidenced by perseverance of the saints. Now that is the more biblical or acceptable theological language than the very innocuous, that is harmless statement, once saved, always saved. And the once saved, always saved idea is derived from and grows out of decisionism. The method that you bring the person to a decision and once he makes the decision, uh, you know, like in chess, we say touch move. You can no longer take back your move once you make the move. So this person perhaps raised his hand and walked the aisle down the altar and somebody led him to the acceptance prayer. And with that move, uh, that's touch move and he can no longer reverse it and that's what their idea is of one saved always saved not only is that innocuous it is in fact very deceiving uh, when a person lives a life that is without any evidence of godly transformation he is simply told you go back to your date of decision did you not decide on this date that you have accepted Christ as your Savior and you're going to heaven and with that everything is dismissed and this is where I warn you against being dismissive because there is a dynamic of assurance uh, you don't give a one-time settles all assurance assurance is dynamic in the sense that if you live a life that is without evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit then it is right for that assurance to wane and become a doubt. And no soul winner has the right <coughs> or the ability to give a one-time assurance. So now the idea that the saved can fall away and lose his salvation is wrong, not because of one saved, always saved, but because of the preservation of God. And the preservation leads to persevering in faith and obedience. And then there is the final wrong interpretation that it is a varying selection of grievous sins. Some say persistent unbelief. Others use the so-called reprobate sins of Romans 1 where we are told several times God gave them up, God gave them over. Uh, I'll say something more of that uh, in due course but uh, let me just say that again the clear identification of the sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So let us then consider that. What is the identity of this unpardonable sin? Well, we need to consider first the idea of the terminology of blasphemy. What is blasphemy? The word blasphemia, according to the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, the Greek root can be used of strong insults thrown at other people, or even unjust accusations, but it is more use, usually used of insults offered to God. And there are references to the book of Revelation 
where the damned or the people loyal to the beast they are the ones blaspheming against God so what is here in this idea of blasphemy well we can look at the Old Testament uh, so blasphemy if we look at the parallel in the Old Testament you remember that distinction when we studied hierarchy ethics the distinction made between sin of ignorance and sin of presumption presumption as the high defiance against God so we can make the assumption that this blasphemy is presumptuous now what is presumptuous sin there is knowledge you know that it is sin you know that you are committing sin and you commit it anyway that already makes it a more grievous sin than that of the sin of ignorance so by parallel to the old testament we can deduce that this must be a presumption presumptuous sin a sin that has knowledge in it and in the context of matthew and mark jesus is assuming the presence of such knowledge in the pharisees they knew they have the light so that's something that already tells us something about blasphemy it is committed by those who have the knowledge but they sin against that knowledge anyway but now and let me make it clear I'm not saying that all sins against knowledge is the unpardonable sin otherwise uh, all of us would have committed the unpardonable sin so let us narrow it down further by looking at the light of the textual materials that is from the texts themselves what do we learn of this sin against the Holy Spirit well and one thing that we learn is that there is hostility it is hostile against the Holy Spirit <clears throat> uh, hostile recognition that means they recognize the Holy Spirit because we are told in Matthew 12 25 in the context of that miracle and the reaction of the Pharisees we are told that Jesus knew their thoughts now, parallel to this is what is said of some men who approached Jesus after the miracle at Cana and they approached Jesus and uh, told him that they were believing in him but then John notes that Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in man so you see the parallel there and what is it that he knew what was in man they were only seeking miracles their professed faith is based on their desire for miracles and isn't it clearly denounced by jesus in the gospels the this generation this crooked generation seeks for a sign so seeking for a sign miracle as the test of the authenticity of Jesus is something that is crooked now in this sense Jesus is also described in reaction to the Pharisees who accused Jesus of doing his exorcism by Beelzebub Jesus knew their thoughts so in other words Jesus could recognize in these people something of uh, a light. Jesus knew that the Pharisees recognized the Holy Spirit, but they chose to insult the work of the Holy Spirit. So they were not just insulting Jesus, they were insulting the work of the Holy Spirit, which we knew clearly set forth before their eyes that it is the work of the Holy Spirit and then you have here a malicious rejection so there is recognition and then there is rejection they recognize the holy spirit but they reject him anyway so this is not talking of doubt uh, doubting because you have not been taught well or doubting because you have been bred in another religion and this is all new to you and uh, you cannot make sense of it at this point 
and you have your doubt or simple denial that you cannot accept it at this point it's too uh, too much for you to think about uh, that's not what we're talking about here rejection here is willful rejection and contradiction in spite of conviction so this is a rejection where there is the presence of conviction that this is the work of the holy spirit but because of their pride that they cannot accept jesus as the one to rule over them they reject anyway and then the third element is perpetuated it is there is perpetuation today in the context of the confessed message of Jesus disciples so this is where the Lucan element comes into play this still continues because we are not just talking here now of being confronted with exorcism and that we recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in the exorcism in fact we no longer are challenged by reaction to miracles we are now challenged by our reaction to the confession of the gospel and when there is that confession of the gospel which is clear and attended by convicting work of the holy spirit then uh, the person with hostility rejects that conviction even though it is clear in the confession that he is hearing now this is similar to the reaction of the Pharisees confronted by exorcism. What confronts sinners now is not exorcism, not any miracle, but the confession of the gospel. So the attitude of the Pharisees betrayed to Jesus' work is today duplicated to the preached gospel. What the Pharisees expressed in their attitude to Jesus in person now is perpetuated by people's attitude to gospel confession right before their ears. When they are convicted by the message and have a consciousness of the Spirit's conviction, but they knowingly reject the message and militantly oppose that conviction, you have something very similar to what the Pharisees had done and are denounced by Jesus as or warned by Jesus of committing the unpardonable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. F.F. F. Bruce has a good summary of this. For every kind of sin, then, for every form of blasphemy or slander, it is implied that forgiveness is available, presumably when the sin is repented of. But what if one were to repent of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? If that, is there no forgiveness for the person who, appear, who repents of this sin? The answer seems to be that the nature of this sin is such that one does not repent of it. Because those who commit it and persist in it do not know that they are sinning. Mark tells his readers why Jesus charged those scribes with blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. It was because they were saying he, was, he has an evil spirit. In Mark's context, then, the sin against the Holy Spirit involves deliberately shutting one's eyes to the light and consequently calling good evil. In Luke, it is irretrievable apostasy. Probably, probably these are not really two conditions but one. So his point is that it is not that the, the person, when he repents, will be unpardoned, will find that he has already committed the unpardonable sin and therefore cannot be pardoned. No. Committing the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is committed by someone who will not repent precisely because of that hostile attitude that keeps rejecting the presence of truth that he knows to be the truth but resists anyway. So blasphemy against the Holy Spirit has become a possibility with the arrival of the new age of gospel preaching so we put this in the light of this uh, reality of the age to come already present it started with christ's coming first coming and it's now continuing until the second coming when this age will terminate blasphemy against the holy spirit is committed by those who have this combination of sinning presumptuously 
against their knowledge of the gospel to be the work of the Holy Spirit and resisting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So it is not the unpardonable sin of someone who is repenting but cannot be pardoned. It is of the unpardonable sin because the one who commits it will not repent because of his hostile rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit despite the light that he has. Now we will try after the break corroborate this with other passages that do not use the, may, uh, the term blasphemy against the Holy Spirit but they have the same effect and we will find that they corroborate our material here. But at this point, is there any question? You can ask audio, video, or chat. Introduce your nickname and your church and place. Any question? Questions or thoughts you'd like to share? Danny of TNC, how about those who deny that the Holy Spirit exists? Are they committing the unpardonable sin? No. Uh, if they deny the existence of the Holy Spirit because that's how they were taught or they think of the Holy Spirit not as a person but a force because they belong to a cult, that's not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the, I know of people and I myself have come from a group that denies uh, or that has a false doctrine of the Holy Spirit and yet uh, the, the Lord has been gracious to them, to me, and I'm sure you know of others coming from a false doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, denying the Holy Spirit in His real identity, but they have not committed the unpardonable sin. Uh, Pao from JSAF Antipolo is an analysis of other sins related to the unpardonable sin. I do not think so. Uh, they, they said that they lied against the Holy Spirit uh, and it may be something close to that but when we talk of the sin or the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit it is not any one particular sin only but rather it is a set of lifestyle of sin against the Holy Spirit to the point that they have rejected the light that they are privileged to have and uh, Ananias and Sapphira became an example of what God can do when we sin against the Holy Spirit. So every sin against the Holy Spirit is way, uh, a grievous sin, but that does not necessarily identify with the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Joel from COC Quezon City, kapag ang isang Kristiyano ay nagkasala at hindi siya nakahingi ng tawad uh, for some reasons, at kinamatayan na niya, maliligtas pa rin ba siya? Uh, sana hindi ka katoliko na naniniwalang kapag hindi ka nakapagkumpisal ay purgatorio ka kung venial sin ang hindi mo na ikumpisal o impyerno ka kung mortal sin ang iyong hindi na ikumpisal. Uh, huwag mong sabihin na ang kaligtasan natin ay nakabatay sa huling kumpisal natin. Uh, hindi ganoon. Kaya nga binayaran ng Panginoon ang lahat nating kasalanan. And sabi ng Romans 8.1, wala nang pagkahatol sa lahat ng nakay Kristo Yesus. So uh, kung sabihin natin kailangan, kailangan na kumpisal mo ang kasalanan mo bago ka mamatay, it's Catholicism, it's sacramentalism. So I reject that from Ilde. Uh, but Batangas, pa, paano po yung pastor na nagdi-discuss ng tulip doctrine tapos sinasabi niya na ang Diyos ng Calvinism ay boboraw, yun po ba unpardonable sin? Hindi. Uh, that is, of course, arrogant and yes, blasphemous. But it's not a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Some of you had been Armenians before and you had very strong language to use against 
the doctrines of grace, uh, but that does not make it unpardonable sin. John Wesley, if you write, read his writings, he has some pretty sharp language to use against Calvinism. Uh, but I believe John, John Wesley to be a good Christian. I do not accept his Armenian theology, but uh, uh, no, it's, that's uh, the unpardonable sin is about uh, your response to a clear gospel confession and then a settled opposition to it that is presumptuous despite the clear work of the Holy Spirit. So that is uh, wrong. So, uh, dining, uh, how about those who are willingly worship, those who willingly worship the devil, like the Satanist, are they guilty of the unpardonable sin? Is there a possibility we can commit the unpardonable sin? I would say something more of whether we can commit the unpardonable sin, but as to Satanism, it is a cult, of course, it is a uh, uh, idolatry, demon worship, and that's a grievous sin. But no, it's not an unpardonable sin. I've known people and I've read about witches who later became Christians and they admitted they were involved in Satan worship, but they became Christians. So I do not believe that Satanism, as, uh, as grievous as it is, yet it is not unpardonable. Okay, other questions? Uh, Jomar of CLC Should we publicly expose someone who committed apostasy even though many members respected him in regard to his humane character? Well, if it is apostasy, you have to censure. You have to excommunicate. Uh, and you... Do not simply ask whether to expose him publicly. You have to excommunicate an apostate. That's the very premise of excommunication. Uh, you do not let him continue becoming, being a member of the church, no matter how respected he is. Even if he is the pastor, and there have been pastors who became apostates. Uh, we were even talking of Joshua Harris last uh, yesterday, I think. And uh, if he were a member of our church, as respected as he is, he would be excommunicated. And that's what we do with the apostate. But I'll say something more about apostasy in a while. Uh, Pastor, Jesse po. Jesse. <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> Pastor, uh, nagladaro lang po sa isip ko. Uh, how can we connect po yung uh, uh, continual rejection ng sa sa nang conviction ng Holy Spirit sa doon sa iris, irresistible uh, grace po ng Dios. Well, that's a good question and we are talking here of a particular work of the Holy Spirit that does not amount to what we call irresistible grace. Irresistible grace is the combination of effectual calling by the Father and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, na summarize na lang na irresistible grace. But uh, it is really the combination of the Father's effectual calling, the Spirit's regenerating work. Now, the Spirit can have a convicting work as common grace, uh, a privilege of those who hear the gospel, and yet uh, it does not amount to regeneration. Uh, and the sin of resistance is still the sinner's accountability, uh, not the deficiency of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is a privilege. To have to hear the gospel at all and then hear the gospel with conviction we will see later when we use Hebrews chapter 6 uh, after the break that there can be some experience of the Spirit's work and yet does not amount to real conversion uh, from Marlon from TVC can be equated to the hardening effect to those who heard the gospels many times but continue to reject it yes it can come to that point where and we will see that there is that warning uh, in Hebrews about the hardening of the heart. Uh, so it is one of the symptoms, as we can say, uh, that one has that uh, sinful state of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that his heart is hardened. Okay, are there questions? Let's take a break.
Okay, let us resume. Uh, there are hanging questions here from uh, from Danny. Is it right to conclude that those who perished without repenting commits the unpardonable sin? No, uh, all who, who perish have not repented. But that doesn't mean that they have all committed the unpardonable sin. And Joel Tabliga, COC, how about those Christians who committed suicide? Did they commit the unpardonable sin as the Roman Catholic teaches? Again, you're too much into the uh, idea of Roman Catholicism. Is it possible for a Christian to fall into committing grievous sins? Yes. Like murder? Yes. Self-murder? Yes. So that means it is possible for one to be a Christian, commit suicide, which is a sin. Uh, but that does not mean that he is not a Christian because suicide is an unpardonable sin. You don't find that in the scriptures, that suicide is an unpardonable sin. Suicide is wrong. Suicide is, suicide is sinful, never commended in the scriptures. But that does not mean that it is the unpardonable sin. A Christian can commit that and still be considered a Christian. But uh, a, first, a Christian who is walking in the Lord will hardly even think of uh, committing suicide. Now please, don't try this at home. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't try, uh, Pastor Noel said, uh, I'll go to heaven anyway. Uh, I, I'm not daring you. So that's my answer. Now, I will erase the board because I want to go now to the corroborating texts. These are texts that do not use explicitly the word blasphemy or unpardonable, but the language used, you will note, are, that is very much similar to what Jesus said of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and I'm convinced that they are speaking of the same state or condition of the one guilty of sin. So I propose parallel to these other New Testament texts and when we look at these uh, Old Testament texts uh, you will find that uh, there are elements of light And then there are those elements of uh, opposition. So we begin with Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. So we will note that uh, there are elements of knowledge, hardened rejection leading to hopelessness. And Hebrews 6 is part of the series of warnings that you find in the book of Hebrews. In fact, there are five uh, such warning texts in the book of Hebrews which appear to teach in a shallow interpretation. They appear to teach that one may lose his salvation. And that is not the case as I will try to show as he is warning here in Hebrews chapter 6 particularly verses 4 to 6, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him, him up to contempt. Now, is he talking here of... Uh, salvation being lost? No, because you will note that he uses here, here the third person. He is referring to a certain kind of people, but in verse 9, uh, the writer says, Though we speak in this way, this sharp language of warning, yet in your case, now that's second person, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things things that belong to salvation. So he's not talking here of salvation being lost. Now, the address to the second person is also used in other warnings. 
where uh, therefore we are to interpret as being addressed to all in, including true believers but you see here uh, the various light this person has and in fact it is described in such a way that you might come to think that who else is this but a true believer because it is said they are enlightened they have tasted the heavenly gift have shared in the holy spirit so those words uh, heavenly gift enlightened and even share of the holy spirit so there is something of the work of the holy spirit that they have experienced and then it says they have tasted the goodness of the word of god so their reaction to the word of god even is one of its goodness uh, th these are all descriptions that we can say are high descriptions of one who appear in every in every angle of that description he must be a very spiritual christian and yet there is the falling away they fall away so you have here elements of being enlightened tasting the heavenly gifts sharing the holy spirit tasting the goodness of the word of god tasting even the powers of the coming age of the age to come now to explain this we have to say that this is where it is important to note of the corporate identity that we belong to as we have studied corporate sins there are corporate sins as there are corporate blessings so a church can be blessed corporately and all those who belong to the corporate uh, identity of the church shares in the blessings the corporate blessings of the church and in that sense these people that the writer describes have a share in those corporate blessings of the church uh, and they genuinely participate we are not questioning that they have had some kind of reaction to the word of god that they consider it it, uh, it in its goodness even some work of the holy spirit in their lives as i was saying in answer to a question in the previous uh, session uh, there are works of the holy spirit which amount to common grace of god they are still grace they are still privilege they are not our rights yet they are the work of the holy spirit but works of the holy spirit that do not necessarily amount to his saving work they may have uh, this personal experience of the level of both the intellectual and the emotional as we see in the case of the various kinds of uh, soils into which the seed of the word was sown in the parable of Jesus of the sower and the soils uh, the first kind of soil no understanding at all immediately taken away by the evil one but the two next the two the next two kinds of soils had an initial good response only to fall away so you have here something consistent with what jesus teaches where a person can have an experience of the joy of the word a joy of professing the gospel and still uh, fall short of genuine faith so one may have all these experiences and possess no genuine faith so here they have element of opposition or rejection is that these people fall away the word is parapipto this must be related to the constant warning of the letter to the hebrews against what we call apostasy though that is through the deceitfulness and hardness of sinning so there's the hardening of the heart which is clearly stated in hebrews 3 12 following about and the, the writer addresses that warning to those he calls brethren and then he warns against the deceitfulness of the heart so these are people who have some kind of experience that can only be described as christian experience and uh, the blessings of god upon the church but they fall away anyway and they fall short of the genuine faith now the result is it is impossible to renew them to repentance what does that mean 
Well, it is a spiritual state of the heart that will never be tender to the call of repentance. So that is why I was saying in the previous session, the unpardonable sin is not that of someone who has committed it and then later repents and he no longer could be uh, accepted despite his repentance because he has committed an unpardonable sin. The simple fact is that the one who is in the state of willful rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit in the gospel will not repent. So it is not that he may repent but impossible to have a saving blessing despite his repentance. So it is not to deny the possibility of repentance of the apostate. We have had apostates in our church and I'm sure in yours as well who had been excommunicated but years later they were restored. And we see the grace of God at work in such restoration. So we do not deny the restoring work of grace even in those who at previous time were apostates. But the case of the uh, one described as impossible to, to repent is that he will not repent for as long as he yields to that condition of the heart. As long as that condition is one of resistance against the light of the Holy Spirit, he will not repent. The commentary of John Owen here is insightful. This is the falling away intended by the Apostle, a voluntary resolved relinquishment of an apostasy from the gospel, the faith, rule, and obedience thereof, which cannot be without casting the highest reproach and contumely. Contumely is an old English word which means insult. <clears throat> imaginable upon the person of Christ himself. So this is the person who knows the gospel but keeps hardening his heart against the uh, invitation, the pleading of the gospel and he is resolved to oppose it. For as long as that is the state of the heart, he really will be in an unpardonable state. And so the Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 warning is a warning against apostasy. Now the question here is, uh, if that is just for those who will become apostates, certainly that is not for Christians. Wrong. Uh, the warnings in Hebrews are part of God's dealing with true believers so that they may be watchful. This is restraining grace of God so as to watch against apostasy. Apostasy is not referring to loss of salvation. Oh, that is not apostasy. When we talk of apostasy, we reject the idea of loss, loss of salvation. That is not apostasy. Apostasy is turning back. from professed faith. So this will not happen to true believers, but this can happen to all who profess to be believers. In other words, the warning is for true believers as well because we profess to be believers. And the apostate is the one who publicly has been admitted to the church, owned as a brother, sister in Christ, and for all intents and purposes, a part of the body of Christ. And yet, at a certain point in time, they turn away from their professed faith. Not that they lost their salvation, but they proved that they were not saved in the first place. That's apostasy. But that is a warning that even true believers should take heed because part of perseverance is using the means of grace, watchfulness against the deceitfulness of sin, and that is one way for us to be restrained from uh, falling away. Not that we will lose salvation again, but as a professing believer, we can come to a point where we prove to be not true believers at all because we have not been watchful. 
I remember that episode in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress when he was in the interpreter's house and he saw that man in the cage. And that man in the cage, uh, Christian, the main character, asked, Who are you? And the man in the cage answered, I am now what I once was not. And when Christian asked him, What were you before? I was once a flourishing professor that is professing faith until I kept off watching. In other words, when he stopped watchfulness of life, that's when he became that man in the cage, which is a representation by John Bunyan of the apostate. That's the apostate, the one who has turned back himself to his professed faith, not one who has lost his salvation. But the warning against apostasy is something that even true believers should take heed uh, because that is for our restraint. So that's Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. It's saying that we can have all this uh, light and still fall away. So that's one corroborating text. Now the next corroborating text is 2 Peter 2.20 following. 2 Peter 2.20 to 22, you have the words of Peter, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. So it says it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. So what do you have here? These are people, we are told, they have escaped defilements. So part of their light. Known the way of the Lord. And then even known the way of righteousness. Now, Peter says they get entangled again. It's part of their falling away. So there are elements of the gospel here. They have escaped the pollutions of the world. They get a knowledge of the Lord and Savior. But you have the elements of apostasy entangled again in them. The word is emploke, uh, literally used for the braiding of hair. Uh, but it refers to getting tied. When you braid the hair, you tie them in such a way that they are bound together. Now, the professing Christian described here gets entangled. He gets tied with the world. So you have here the case of uh, a professing Christian who gets tied to the world and the result, if in Hebrews, impossible to renew them to repentance, in this case, Peter is even sharper in his language that the last state has become worse for them than the first. And he says, it would have been better for, ne for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Can okay, you imagine this? Peter is saying, it would have been better for them not to have heard the gospel at all and made a profession of faith than to make a profession of faith and then turn back. Oh, why is that? Well, the only explanation is, the greater punishment that awaits a person who has had the privilege of hearing the gospel and making a profession of the gospel only to turn their back to that professed faith. It would be better for someone who has not heard of the gospel at all. This is similar to what Jesus said of the cities of uh, 
the Capernaum and Bethsaida where he says it is more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. How can that be? When you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, you think of the decadence of their immorality. But there is a, a condition in which those who are in that condition are worse off than even the immoral of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what is the condition of these people? They have heard the gospel. And if it is worse for those who have heard the gospel but have not repented, it is even worse for those who have heard the gospel, made profession of repentance and faith, only to turn back and prove themselves to be not true believers, not genuine believers at all. That is something that Peter says is worse. And then you have 1 John 5, 16 and following is our last this is the so-called sin unto death so first john 5 16 and 17 if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death he shall ask and god will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death there is sin that leads to death i do not say that one should pray for that all wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. You see, John is laboring to make a distinction between sins that do not lead to death. Yet, there is a sense in which all sins are mortal. All sins, uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin or the penalty of sin is death. Uh, but there is a distinction made between sins that Christians in the church may intercede for, they can continue to pray for those who commit those sins. And then there is the there are those who commit what John calls hamartia prostanaton, sin unto death. And this particular sin necessitates the withdrawal of intercession. You no longer pray for that. Now in terms of ecclesiology, this is imposed by the church's corporate act of excommunication. Now, let me say this, this is more in ecclesiology, but excommunication is the last public means of grace that the church can avail to a person it will excommunicate. After the excommunication, there can no longer be any public means of grace the church can avail. There are those who, after the excommunication, keep uh, praying in the church, prayer meeting for those excommunicated. You do not do that. If you are not prepared to withdraw your intercession, you are not prepared to excommunicate. You only excommunicate someone who you feel has come to the point of apostasy. You excommunicate and then part of excommunication is withdrawal of fellowship as well as withdrawal of intercession. That's what John is saying. You do not pray for them anymore. Now, in this letter, this may be identif identifiable with former members of the church who have not persevered. You see this in 1 John 2.19, where John says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. So you see the uh, description of John of us, meaning they really are not identified as believers because if they are, they would have continued, they would have persevered. But now they are exposed as not of us, they are not true believers. And they are, in the strong language of John, antichrists. Uh, in the small a, small case a sense that they are no longer in loyalty to the real Christ but to a false Christ. So you have here again uh, people who at one point were part of the prayer of the church so they were prayed for. So that's part of their life. They are members of the church. But now, once they are excommunicated, uh, they have committed the sin unto death. 
And for as long as that is their state, the church does not make them an object of their intercession. So these are some, I believe, of the clear corroborating texts, though not using the explicit language of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that Jesus uses in the synoptics, but they are enough to see the similarity. These are people like the Pharisees who had the light of the Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus right before them, or in the version of Luke, the confession of the gospel. And they have the light, they have the knowledge, similar to this. But then, they instead charge Jesus of doing it in the power of Beelzebub, or in the case of Luke, those who will reject uh, with hardness of heart their understanding and privilege of knowing the gospel. So from this, I want to draw some conclusions. Well, why is this an unpardonable sin? Well, first, it is unpardonable not because the sin transcends the merits of Christ. That cannot, that cannot be the case. It is not as if Christ only died for so much. And when you exceed that, the excessive sin can no longer be covered by the blood of Christ. In no way should we limit what Christ's atonement can cover. So it is not because of the excess of sin. Remember, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That should always be the note of our preaching. Also, it is unpardonable, not because the offender is beyond the Spirit's power. Again, as I've said, there are works of the Holy Spirit which are of common grace, not amounting to salvation. So it is not in the sense of the Spirit trying hard to bring the person to faith, but the Spirit is failing. Uh, we cannot again accept that kind of proposition. Rather, it is unpardonable because willful rejection generates a hardened heart to the conviction of the gospel. So in other words, the problem is not in the deficiency, any deficiency in the cross of Christ. There is none. The problem is not in any limitation of the Holy Spirit. Again, there is none. The problem is in the sinner. For as long as the sinner yields to that hardness of heart, despite the privilege of knowing the gospel, he will not repent. He will refuse to repent. And that is his guilt. That is his culpability. That is accountability. Not because he is trying to repent, but cannot because he has committed an unpardonable sin. So we need to be very careful in counseling when someone inquires of us about the matter. So some pastoral points. Effective pastoral oversight must have an understanding of the deceitfulness of the heart. And that deceitfulness, as I've said, can go both ways. Of, on the one hand, dismissive of sin, but on the other hand, creating false guilt. So let us identify people who definitely are not guilty of the unpardonable sin. They will come to you and probably seek counsel. Those who fear or wonder that they may have committed it, you know, they are anxious. I think I have committed the unpardonable sin and the God can no longer forgive me. That, that, that very anxiety proves them to be not those who are guilty of the unpardonable sin. Then those who struggle with the tax of blasphemous thoughts. And there are times that some blasphemous thoughts are injected into you by the evil one. Uh, John Bunyan struggled a lot. Uh, you will read this in his testimony of conversion, grace abounding to the chief of sinners, how blasphemous thoughts would be injected into him and he would struggle against it. And that does not mean that because blasphemous thoughts are injected into you that you are guilty of this. And there will be people who will approach you and seek your counsel and say, Pastor, I have thought this way about God and this is just so grievous. Again, the very fact that they are struggling with it proves that they are not guilty of the unpardonable sin. And then those who continue sincerely to be under the means of grace, 
they may be struggling with sin, perhaps they have some besetting sins that they need to deal with, but they have not withdrawn themselves from the means of grace. They are still seeking to know that victory over their besetting sins. Again, that does not identify someone who has committed the unpardonable sin. But then there are people to watch and warn. No, you do not come to the conclusion you have committed the unpardonable sin. But rather we warn them, uh, watch. First, those who persistently harden their heart in unbelief under the sound of the word of the gospel. And there will be people in your congregation. Many of them are children of members who have perhaps attended the church from their childhood, have heard the sound of the gospel for so many years and have remained resistant to it. Or perhaps have already come to the point of callousness after hearing so much. Uh, you have to periodically bring into your preaching such warning against such people. Plead with them. Plead with pathos. Not scolding them, but plead with pathos. Then those who manifest an apostatizing direction. As we have been given such warnings in the book of Hebrews, these are professing Christians and yet turning their back to the faith. Uh, perhaps you see them less and less in the public assembly of the church when it becomes too easy for them to absent or not to be part of the gathered church. Or they become more and more in the company of the world and of sinners more than with God's people. These are apostatizing direction. Again, you are not making a conclusive statement. You have committed an unpardonable sin, but it is right for you to warn that they watch. And finally, those who stubbornly justify their sin against the light of the word. In other words, there will be people whose sins are clear, but they justify those sins because probably of gain or profit and pleasure and they keep justifying those sins rather than struggle with them, fight against them. So that is very hardening of the heart as the writer of Hebrews has warned. So let me suggest the Puritans excel in this. I rarely find a modern book by Reformed writers who have the excellence that the Puritans exhibited in their pastoral dealing with issues like this. So I would suggest to you to immerse your reading in the Puritans. And of course, you know me, I am for theological updating of your readings, read the current publications, but do not forget the Puritans. The Puritans are, to my mind, remain unmatched when it comes to pastoral dealing. I particularly commend William Guthrie in the book, The Christian's Great Interest. And then John Owen, uh, in one of his volumes, he has apostasy from the gospel. And he has some very sobering warnings in that treatise. So the pastor must seek to master what the Puritans have called cases of conscience or what is more in modern word called casuistry. Casuistry is dealing with case of conscience. People will ask you, what if I have done this? What if I have committed this? I have thought of this. So those what ifs, those are cases of conscience and you have a lot of this in the Puritan writings. And I would urge you also, I have uh, also to use the uh, work by another Puritan, Remedies Against Satan's Devices. I think it's Thomas Watson. Uh, but those are works that you do well to immerse your mind in to be a very wise pastor in dealing with people on this issue. Well, any question? Any thought?
mode. Pastor, can you explain more regarding about your definition of apostasy and the wrong notion of it? Well, uh, I've erased it on, from the board, so let me repeat again. Apostasy is not loss of salvation. We do not believe that a genuinely saved person can be lost, that he can lose his salvation. But this is referring to uh, uh, turning away from professed faith. So this is something that generally applies to all who profess to be believers, true or false. Meaning, whether you're a genuine Christian or a false Christian, this will apply to you because you profess the faith. Profess is to confess it publicly, and we all have done that. Now, the warning against apostasy therefore applies even to believers, even if they will not actually lose their salvation but the warning functions like a restraint it makes you watchful watchfulness will make you vigilant in your means of grace in attending the church in hearing the word etc that will keep you from declining which is the preface to apostasy when you begin to decline and so uh, that's the definition of apostasy not losing salvation but turning away from one's professed faith. Mars, uh, is it available in GMA Library? The Puritan, oh yeah, we, we have uh, a good number of Puritan works in our library. If you, are, if you care to visit uh, the library, uh, Sir Ritman will be there to uh, assist you. And the, the e-books are available, I'm sure. And the e-books are a lot more affordable than printed ones. Although I still prefer printed ones. But uh, given the situation, uh, I have been using a lot more of e-books. Danny uh, is falling away. Recording in progress. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, uh, Danny is falling away and backsliding have the same meaning. Well, the, if we use the word backsliding as it is used in the most frequent, the most dense of usage of backsliding is in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah does not use it in the common uh, way it is used today. You know, some people who say, oh, Christian ako, backslider lang. Uh, and what they really mean is similar to the cardinal Christian theory and it is false. Uh, so, falling away and backsliding can have the same meaning in the Jeremiah sense of the people of God, the Jew, uh, people of Judah who were turning away from Yahweh. So, it's not the Christian who is just called but backsliding is in the sense of falling away. But we use the word falling away because that is the word used in the New Testament, particularly in the, in the letter to the Hebrews. Joel uh, C.O.C. Can a true believer become an apostate? Again, we come back to this. Uh, if you mean a true believer can lose his salvation, the answer is no. How many times do I need to repeat that a true believer will not lose his salvation if he is a genuine believer? But precisely if he is a genuine believer, he will persevere. And why will he persevere? Because God is preserving him. That's the answer. But what I am saying is that the warning against apostasy is for true believers as well. We need to be restrained by the warning. So what nothing to say. Eh, hindi naman ako, uh, totoong kristyano naman ako, kaya hindi ko kailangan ng babala. Eh, magkakamali ka. Ang babala ay ibinibigay para pigilin nga tayo sa natural na 
ugali natin na manlamig at magpabaya sa ating uh, mga kasangkapan na pangbiyaya. So again, I hope that is clear. Uh, apostasy is not about a true believer losing his salvation. But the, the warning against apostasy is applicable to true believers. Uh, Pao, uh, does the man who has been excommunicated because he has sexual relation with his father's wife in 1 Corinthians considered as an apostate? You see, the one who was restored in 2 Corinthians, that we do not know. There is the possibility, uh, but do you remember that between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul refers to a grievous letter uh, in 2 Corinthians 2. Uh, he speaks of a grievous letter he has written, which is not the first letter to the Corinthians, nor the Second Corinthians in between, but it's no longer existing because it is not meant to be part of the canon. So uh, something happened between the first two letters. So is it the same man? Uh, there is a possibility, but there is no certainty. Uh, but the sexual sin committed by a professing Christian is censurable and perhaps even to the point of excommunication as we see in 1 Corinthians 5 but it is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, Tan Hling O uh, from Myanmar How should we Christians avoid blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? We'll just continue persevering in terms of the means of grace. Uh, and again, a true believer will never commit blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and that is why we need to continue to have a tender attitude to sin. That is, we are sensitive to sin and we do not come to the point of callousness or what the writer of Hebrews calls the hardening of the heart. Other questions? Uh, yung uh, apostasy po uh, uh, pwede po uh, pwede po nating sab- kaya sabihin na na uh, yung sinasabi niyo po kanina na hindi sila uh, yung yung knowledge nila dun sa Panginoong Hesus Kristo ay uh, walang walang sabi nating saving work ng ng Holy Spirit sa kanila yeah it can be a knowledge that can be very theologically accurate. Uh, they have good Christology and all that. And at, at some point, kagaya rin nung sa parable of the sower and the soils, they were, they were responsive uh, for a time until tribulations come, etc. Or the deceitfulness of riches, as Jesus warned. Uh, so that knowledge can be theologically accurate, but it is not saving. It has not come to the point of a real saving faith. Okay, other questions? Uh, Regarding about uh, 1 John chapter 5, Pastor, uh, yung scene that leads to that, uh, uh, I may I might miss it earlier. Is that uh, the unpardonable scene? Or, uh, it corroborates. Uh, it is, these texts that I use have Hebrews 6, 4 following, 2 Peter 2, 20 following, and 1 John 5, 16, which is the sin unto death. Corroborate the situation of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit by the Pharisees because there is both the element of light in the case of First John 5 they were as John describes them they were once of us uh, but they did not continue so there is an element of light but they have committed a sin unto death which John describes as that sin that should no longer be interceded for now who who do you not intercede for? If a person is a member of the church, it is our duty to pray for one another. And so the person who we do not intercede for is a person who has come to the point of excommunication. Uh, how about the lukewarm being mentioned in Revelation 3.16? Can we say that those people are in danger of falling away or apostasy? Well, in this case, it is the apostasy of the church not of individuals. Remember that this is a warning against the church in Laodicea. So, uh, and lukewarm there does not 
mean as some I have heard many preaching on this that describes the person as either hot or cold or uh, it's just describing something that's not potable there's water system in Laodicea at that time where the water is not potable anyway not drinkable uh, and that is the state of a church that is, that is losing its identity as a church in terms of its marks and it can come to a point that as Jesus warned I will spew you out of my mouth so uh, that is about, about a church not an individual Any questions? <clears throat> Let's take a break